well. And thank you, Miss Rachel, for helping us on the piano. Let's take our Bibles and turn to look at Psalm, Psalm 40 tonight. Psalm 40. We're going to talk very specifically this evening about the body and the blood. These are two things that are not enjoyable <laughs> topics for many. And truly, it is a most gruesome scene in the Word of God. But yet, it was a very important part of our redemption. And we need to know a little bit about what the Word of God has to say concerning the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to first look at the body of Jesus Christ as we begin in Psalm 40. Now, we're going to turn to many passages in the Word of God this evening to make our point about the body of Christ and uh, what that should mean to us. And then we're going to look to the blood. And uh, by the will of the Lord, we'll get through this pretty quickly. But we just want to be able to rest tonight on the Scriptures. And I pray that the Word of God would impact greatly as we solely examine what it has to say concerning the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It says in Psalm 40 in verse number 6, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Let me explain what it means when it says, Mine ears hast thou opened. There was a testimony in the Old Testament books of the law of a servant that if he was going to commit himself to his master, he had every opportunity to leave his master's side and go free. But if the servant loved his master, they would take his ear and they would put it against the threshold of the door of the doorway, and they would take a mole and they would jam it through the ear of that servant, and that would be a symbol uh, identifying that servant with his willingness to do what his master wanted him to do and to be underneath his master. And so here it's prophesied through David about the Lord Jesus Christ. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And so we understand that that was David's heart and David's desire. But I want you to realize that it was the Lord Jesus Christ that we are referring to. Go to the book of Hebrews with me. The book of Hebrews chapter number 10. And as you come to Hebrews chapter number 10, you're passing from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And when you get to the New Testament, we're no longer dealing with David talking about how he delighted to do the will of God. But we're talking about how the Lord Jesus Christ was so willing to come to do the will of God. We see in chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews in verse number 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast thou pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Here's these words, once for all. Now take your Bible and go to the book of Hebrews, or excuse me, Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. Now a very familiar passage of scripture for you, but as we look at Philippians chapter 2, let's be reminded of the willingness of Christ in his body to do the will of God. Look at what it says in Philippians 2 verse number 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The reason why his name is to be above all is because of the willingness to serve people that Jesus had. His obedience to come wrapped incarnate to be part 
part of this world to die on the cross for your sin and for my sin. This is the body of Jesus Christ that we are dealing with. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. We're jumping back into the Old Testament now. Now this passage is particularly interesting during the Easter season and as well during the times of the Lord's table. But as we look at this passage of the Word of God, let us remember that all of these scriptures didn't just come into being at one time. Over the course of thousands of 1500 years, the Word of God was established and put together by the will of the Lord. These holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we look at Isaiah 53 and we read this about our Savior. We look at verse number 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearer is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he, was, and he made his grave with, with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now turn in your Bibles to the book of First John chapter number 2. First John chapter number 2, we're talking about the body of Jesus Christ and what the body of Jesus Christ went through and what it and why it had to go through that, that you and I may have freedom and forgiveness of our sins. As we look at 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 1, the word of God says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now notice verse number 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Mind you, red, yellow, black, and white, short, tall, hairy-headed, skinny, and bald, Jesus Christ died for all. Amen. And he took upon him the sins of the whole world. We understand that this great weight of sin was upon him, but let's examine a little bit more about who he is. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And as we examine 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, we were here earlier today, we're going to look at the very last verse of the chapter. Chapter 5, verse number 21. And this describes who our Savior was. This describes everything about him while he lived. The Word of God says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Tonight, we need to understand that in the body of Jesus Christ, there was no sin whatsoever. There was an understanding given in the scripture that our Savior was perfect. He was sinless. He is the Almighty God. Can I ask you a question? Why is it that when we come to a time of the Lord's Supper, that we have what is called leaven or unleavened bread and unfermented wine? Why is it that we remember Christ in those areas? Why do we have those two things, unleavened and unfermented, before us? Why is it? I'll tell you why it's very simple. Because Jesus Christ was perfect. Jesus Christ was sinless. And in the Word of God, anything that was leavened and anything that was fermented was a picture of sin. Listen to this statement. The chemical definition of ferment or yeast is a substance in a state of putrefaction. 
the atoms of which are in a continual motion. And by way of definition, they're continually moving to the worse. They are continually moving to be bad. They are continually moving to destruction. If you were to read the Old Testament, you would find that there is a law that would forbid them strictly to make any offerings to God with leavened bread. They were not to use anything that was leavened in their worship. They were not to use anything that was leavened in their offering. They were not to use anything that was a picture of sin. Why? Because ultimately everything in the Old Testament was pointing forward to everything in the New Testament. And if Jesus Christ is sinless, all things that represent Him are going to be that of no sin. And that's why we have unleavened bread. Many places you see those little square crackers that are made perfectly by some type of machine. Other places, kind of like what we have tonight, they crunch up some type of cracker and put it in the plate. Other places yet take some type of tortilla and, and tear it up and put it in and pass it around. But the whole idea is this, we want something that represents that which is not of leavened or, or, or yeast filled bread because our Savior in His body was not full of sin and continually growing worse. He was perfect, He was holy, and He always will be. Now take your Bible and go to the book of Matthew chapter 16. With an understanding of what the word leavened means, we go to Matthew chapter 16 and we see a little story here about the disciples, the Pharisees, the scribes, and what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say about the leavened bread. As we look at Matthew chapter 16, Jesus always had a way of teaching His disciples something that was very valuable. Now understand what the Pharisees are asking Jesus. In verse number 1, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them when it is evening ye say it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites ye can discern the face of the sky but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. Jesus then says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. What was the sign that Jesus was talking about when he said, The only sign I give you is that of Jonah? Jonah was, Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights, and so must the Son of Man be in the center of the earth. That was the only thing that the scribes and the Pharisees needed to believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Then look at verse number 5. And when the disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Have you ever forgotten your lunch before? Have you ever left it at home or left the food somewhere else and you're like, oh man, I gotta do this now, I gotta go to the store, I gotta, I've forgotten. The disciples had forgotten. Then look at verse 6. Jesus said unto them, Take ye heed and beware of the leaven, the ferment, the yeast, the continual putrefaction of the Pharisees and the scribes. They reasoned among themselves, the disciples did, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread that Jesus said these things? Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, or how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake unto you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the ferment? the yeast, the continuous putrefaction of their sin. Yet, or then, understood they how he bade them not beware of leaven bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. In the Word of God, what we understand Jesus is saying, he's not telling the disciples you cannot have a pizza. He's not telling the disciples that you cannot have the bread you picked up when I made a miracle. He's telling the disciples that you need to beware of the continuous 
continual progression of sin, the exceeding sinfulness of the religious crowd that's trying to indoctrinate you and trying to confuse you against God. You do not need their leaven. You do not need their yeast. You do not need their continual putrefaction. You do not need the increase of sinfulness in your life. And the Lord Jesus Christ teaches them that before we're talking about physical food, it's important to look to the spiritual. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if my memory serves me correctly. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 6, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was very much in derision. They were very much divided. They were very much in a place where certain sects of the church were glorying in themselves. And then in verse number 6, Paul says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little yeast, a little fermentation, a little bit of putrefaction, a little bit of sin, a little bit of error is going to leaven the whole lump. It is going to cause the rest of the body of Christ to be involved in just a little leaven, a little yeast, a little fermentation, a little bit more sin, and it's going to move them away from God. Why is it important that you as an individual live for God? Because if you live for God it can be contagious but if you live for the world and for sin that will be contagious as well and a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump purge out therefore verse 7 the old leaven that ye may be a new lump when we deal with the Old Testament and God says, you know what, you're going to have to take the old leaven out and make new leaven. What he is dealing with is the fact that when they would use that yeast to, in their breads, it would eventually turn to a place of spoiling and it would be no good. It could cause somebody to be sick and it was nothing that was good to be offered for the Lord. So therefore what you would do is throw out the old leaven and bring in the new. He says, therefore, pull out the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For ye even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Do you realize tonight that as we look to the picture of Christ on the cross, His body, that He died for us, and we use the unleavened bread or a semblance of it, we understand this evening that this is just a cracker. This is is just a piece of unleavened bread. The unleavened bread that God desires from you is the unleavened bread of sincerity for God and truth for God. And all God's people said, that's what He desires of you. He doesn't want malice. He doesn't want wickedness. He does not want fermentation. He does not want putrefaction. He does not want continual sinfulness. He wants your life to be divided from sin and the error of your way to be lived for God. Look at what he says in verse number 9. I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, nor with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now now I have written you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such in one not to eat. He's saying do not fellowship, do not commune with that one. To make sure that ye do not allow a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. So we're dealing with the fact that our bodies must then be important. If Christ's body was sinless, it is, should be the desire of our life to live in such a direction that we have a holy life. We'll never be sinless. We'll never be completely perfect. But in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of who He is, we can live a life that honors God and glorifies Him. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Romans chapter 12 as we're still on this particular topic of the body of Jesus Christ. The body that was given for you and for me. That we may understand that our iniquities are no more. That we may understand that we are forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for an example for us. In chapter 12 of the book of Romans, it's familiar to you, I'm sure. If not, listen carefully. Either way, listen up. 
I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God listen friends God's been so good he's been so good to us undeserving sinners by the mercies of God listen up that ye present your bodies a living your bodies a living your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service it's just what you're supposed to do huh it's just how you're supposed to live as a body for him you're supposed to live holy then in verse number 2 and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God Certainly we're in a season of our year where there's a whole bunch of push to a conformity to a certain way. You've got to have this certain toy. You've got to have this certain clothing. You've got to watch this certain video. You've got to have this certain workout for the new year. You've got to do this. And if you're not careful, you'll get swept up in a push to be conformed to the world instead of a focus of being transformed by God by the renewing of your mind why that your body may be a living sacrifice as Christ's body was a living sacrifice let's talk a little bit about the blood go to Ephesians chapter 1 we could continue about the body of Christ what it's done for us and how our bodies should be lived there's plenty of verses that we could go to off the top of the head but we're going to the book of Ephesians now to examine the blood of Jesus Christ his blood is so important you live in a day, and you may even see some videos recently where people say, you don't need to tell folks about the blood. You don't need to preach on the blood. We don't need the... Yes, you do need the blood. I realize there's certain versions of the Bible that's being created that take the blood out. But I'm telling you, my dear friends, the blood of Jesus Christ is vitally important to your salvation. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 7. In whom? In who? In Christ. We have redemption. Through his, what church? His blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of his grace. Do you realize tonight that the riches of God are so much more than the richest man that's ever lived? Do you realize tonight that according to his riches, his blood has been given to you that you may have forgiveness of sin? Look at chapter number 2 and join me at verse number 13. But now in Christ Jesus, the Messiah... The Jesus who shall save his people from their sins. Ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh or brought close by the, what church? Oh man, do you realize you could be as good as you possibly can in your body, but without the blood of Christ, you would not be close to God. You need the blood of Jesus Christ in your life. Look at the book of Colossians, just a couple books forward. Ephesians, Philippians. Colossians, when you look at those epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, God eats popcorn. The book of Colossians, and we look at chapter number 1 and verse number 14. Here it is again reiterated in the scriptures. Chapter 1 verse 14, in whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his what church? His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then look at verse number 20. And having made peace through the what? The blood of the cross. You see, the blood is vitally important to our eternal peace and our eternal redemption being gained. We need the blood of Jesus on our lives. Now take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 9. You say, oh, the Hebrews again. Yes, the Hebrews again. I want you to not only see that Hebrews is big about the body, but Hebrews is big about the blood as well. It's all throughout the book of Hebrews. It is the greatest book in your te New Testament that deals with the sacrifice of the Savior, the body and the blood of our Lord. In Hebrews chapter number 9, we pick up the reading at verse number 9 which was a figure for the time, talking about the Old Testament tabernacle, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, notice these words, that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse watchings, and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation or Christ's crucifixion. But Christ became an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So what Hebrews is saying is, it's not about the building, the temple, the tabernacle, the altar, the blood of goats and bullocks. But we see in verse number 12 what we're going to talk about. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, Back to the Second Corinthians 5.21, without spot. He knew no sin, though he became sin for us. He was without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator. He's the one that comes in between us and God. Of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they that which are called might receive the promise of internal inheritance for where a testament is there must also of necessity be the death of a testator Jesus Christ had to die with his body had to shed his blood that we may have eternal life then verse 22 and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission we need the blood go to the book of Revelation chapter 1 Revelation chapter 1. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and look at the very beginning. We see John in verse number 4. John is introducing who he is writing to. And as we look at who John is writing to, the seven churches which are in Asia, he says, Grace, peace unto you uh, from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now notice very specifically what he says in verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, there he is again, the one that's going to save us from our sins, the great Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and from Jesus, who is the faithful witness, he'll never give up, he'll never back down, he will always be, he's so much better than goats and bulls and bullocks, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own, what church? The blood of Christ was so important. I couldn't save you. You couldn't save me. We can't save each other. It is the work of Christ on the cross, his body and his blood that hath saved us. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 12. You've got to see this. This is so awesome. This is so important concerning the work of Christ and the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter number 12 and verse number 11, we're dealing with people in chapter number 12 that are overcomers. Notice how they overcome. And they overcame Him. Who's the Him? Look at verse number 9. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him. The accuser of the brethren. They overcame him. The devil, the antichrist, the great dragon. They overcame him by the, what church? The blood of the Lamb. Capital L, Lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ. The one and only Lamb. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Hey, we look at the the Lord's table and we understand this evening that we see a picture of unleavened bread in the bread that we are to eat bread without a progressive sinfulness as it is pictured in the Word of God. And then we take of the grape juice or that which symbolizes the wine that is not fermented. Why is it that we have that as a picture? And the reason is because the blood of Jesus Christ was not touched with human sin. The blood of Jesus Christ was perfect from within and without. And we need to have a good representation in our symbolism. 
of who our Savior is. He was not exceeding sinful like you and I. He was perfect and holy. Fermentation. Yeast, sinfulness, the continual progression of putrefaction. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter number 30. Turn back there with me. Let's understand a little bit about the difference between good wine and bad wine. Good wine and bad wine. We look at the book of Proverbs chapter 30. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the difference between the two. It specifically lets you know about that which is completely fermented or that which is bad. In Proverbs chapter number 30, we examine and we look at what a second or excuse me, a third king, excuse me, let's say that again, the third king is in 31, the second king is in 30, the first king, King Solomon, dealt with the rest of the chapters before that, but this king, King Agur, in chapter number 30, excuse me, go to chapter 31, I was in the wrong chapter, chapter 31, King Lemuel, he says about his mother's words, the prophecy that his mother taught him, what my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. She said, you're going to be a king. Do not get involved in that which destroys kings. What destroys kings? The wrong type of women. And then verse number four, the wrong type of wine. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, lest they drink and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So we look at the scriptures and we understand that strong drink, as it would continue to say, is to be given to somebody who's ready for destruction. A king should not be ready to be destroyed. A king should be ready to live, should be ready to rule, should be ready to reign in the power of his kingdom and do it in a way that honors and glorifies God. We take our Bibles and we go to, let's see, Proverbs chapter number 20. Look at Proverbs chapter 20. The Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 1 that wine is a what church? Hey, we're not just dealing with strong drink at this time. We're dealing with wine. And the Word of God says that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And then look at what it says about these two for the rest of the verse. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Listen, you want to be wise? Then stay away from that which is fermented. You want to be wise? Stay away from that which is exceeding sinful. If you want to be wise, go in the right direction. You want some more on it? Look at Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23, dealing with the fermentation of wine. Therefore, we understand that certainly fermented wine could never be a true, genuine picture of the blood of Christ because it's full of a picture of sinfulness and Instead of righteousness. But good wine is a picture of something completely different. Look at what it says in Proverbs 23. And understand in verse number 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek Mixed wine, fermented wine. They look not upon the wine, or it says, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. We're talking about when it begins to ferment, when it begins to move in the wrong direction. At the last, it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, women that you're not supposed to have. Thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of the mast. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? Here's probably the saddest words about someone who drinks alcohol. Even though all of that I went through, I will seek it yet again. My friends, this type of wine is not a good picture of the blood of Jesus Christ. And furthermore, we talk about the way people live lives and say you should not live with this in your life. Look at what it says in verse number 20 of the same chapter. Be not among wine bibbers. It's not even talking about you drinking it. Be not among them, among riotous eaters of the flesh 
For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall close, clothe a man with rags. There is a difference between good wine and bad wine. There was a day in America where you could say the word cider, and you did not know if you were referring to something that was good, like apple cider at Tanner's, or cider that was pegged with alcohol or spite. Wine in the Bible, be careful. It could be referring to that which is fermented or it could be referring to that which is new, new wine. The type of wine that Jesus created at that supper, that, at that wedding. The type of wine of purity. Why would Jesus create anything that represents sin or brings someone to sinfulness? So we look in the scriptures and we understand that we need to be very, very careful not to get offended at the word of God. The Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. If you're right with God, you're okay with his word. And when his word pricks your heart, you're not going to say, oh my, you're going to say, oh me. And you're going to make a decision to draw a little bit closer to God. And that's the whole purpose of looking at the body and the blood of Christ. I want to take you to a chapter in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen to these words. Don't shut me off now. Listen as we sum up the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As we know that His body was perfect. As we know that His blood was given for the remission of our sins. As we understand that everything about Him was correct and right. And as we know that we can't possibly be that good. We look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And we understand a little bit about our Lord and Savior. When it comes down to what we are supposed to do. Look at what it says in verse number 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Why? Because it is written. Be ye holy. Why? For I... Am holy. Why do I stay away from a sinful life? Because of who Jesus is. Why do I stay away from sinful things? Because of who Jesus is. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that's where we're stopping as we look to the Lord's Supper tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we look at verse number 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He's not transforming his body into a piece of bread. And neither do we take a piece of bread and transform it into the body of Christ. It says, as an example, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in, what's that word? It doesn't say that you're doing this for salvation. I want to be very clear because there's a people that believe that you have to have this to be saved or to keep yourself saved. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God simply says you're to do this as a way of remembering me. Because when we remember the unleavened bread, we're remembering the perfection of His body and the body that was beaten and bruised on the cross of Calvary for our sins. When we remember the blood, we're remembering the holy blood of Christ that was given that day at the cross that fell on a holy ground that we may have the remission of sins, that we may have forgiveness. And we're doing this, the Lord's Supper, that we may simply remember Him. And oh, how awesome it is to remember a Savior who loved us so much that he gave his body and his blood. Verse 25, in the same manner he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So until he comes back, we're promoting to this world, by what we do here, that Jesus died that we may live. Look at verse 27. This is important. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So, 
that you don't eat it or drink it unworthily, let a man, verse 28, examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Okay, this is intended for those who are saved. This is intended for those who are part of the church of Jesus Christ. This is intended for those who have examined themselves so that they may eat of it. God is not giving this statement that, that, that somebody may eat or drink unworthily because He doesn't want you to. He wants you to. And so tonight, the reason why we come together is to remember His body, His death, until we come. And so that it gives you an extra opportunity to examine yourself that you may come into this fellowship together with us tonight. And remember Him. And making sure that all is well between you and God. Be ye holy. Eating of this bread will not make you holy. Eating of this, drinking of this grape juice will not make you holy. Performing various acts will not clean the inward man. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. We submit ourselves to Him. We examine ourselves. So tonight, fitting, slightly different than sometimes we've done the Lord's Supper. It's kind of bridging, it. the invitation time is going to kind of bridge right into the Lord's Supper. I'm going to invite Miss Rachel to come right now and she's going to play the piano as she normally would in an invitation. And I'm just going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes as we normally would. But may this be important this evening. May this be a decision tonight to come before your Lord and examine yourself. You don't want to take him worthily. If somebody chooses not to take of the bread and take of the grape juice, you don't judge them for that. That's between them and God. If they choose not to do that, that's perfectly fine. That's between them and the Lord. But examine yourself so that you may eat of it, so that you may drink of it, so that you may be brought back into that sweet fellowship or remain continually within that sweet fellowship with your God and stay close to Him and be ye holy even as He also is holy. A decision tonight. As she plays the piano, let's take some time to be quiet. And then after that, I'm going to call a couple men to help me with the distributing of this. I will say that we need to be careful. Young people, if your parents say, no, not right now, then you should obey them and say, okay, I'll wait. Listen to your parents' discretion on that. Let's make this time full of sincerity and truth. Search your hearts, examine them.